listening to Frank Klopacki, composer, producer, drummer, who wrote all those songs for video games. And uh, we're so excited to have him here on Sonic Tonic Experience. My name is Darren Kramer. Frank, tell us a little bit how you got into this and what mindset you have to be in in order to create music like this. So um, I got into this pretty young as well. Um, I, I had uh, found out about a company called Westwood Studios uh, when I was in high school. Um, my cousin was uh, the co-founder, uh, Lewis Castle, and um, he, uh, I was looking for a, a part-time job over the summer uh, you know, between my junior and senior year in high school. So he uh, kind of gave me the idea of, hey, uh, why don't you apply to be a, a tester at, at Westwood, you know? And I'm like, what's that? And he says, well, you just basically play video games, try to break them and report your findings. And then, nice. you know, then we tried, then we fix what you reported. And then you have to you know, verify that it was fixed and all that. And, oh, okay, cool. That sounds fun. You know, who, who wouldn't love to play games, get paid for it, right? And this is in what uh, city? Uh, Vegas. Okay. Vegas. Yeah. I mean, I grew up there. So, um, so anyways, I, I get in there and I, I start doing the job. and. Uh, you know, little did I know that, you know, it wasn't as, as quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, it's not just play the game and, you know, all of that. It's you really have to go out of your way to break these games. Like do stuff that doesn't make any sense just for the sake of doing it. Like, you know, what happens if I go to the top left hand corner of the screen, you know, for no reason? What happens if I try to buy this building and not this one? What happens if I get this tank and and uh, attack specifically this thing? You know, does anything happen? Anything strange? Do I get a glitch graphically? Do I hear anything that's wrong? Do I, you know, uh, does it crash, you know, for no reason? You got to find ways to break it. And then to report these findings, what we call bugs, you submit that, the programmers will look at that, try to reproduce it, fix it. Once they feel they have, then they send it back and say, okay, we think we fixed it. Can you verify that? And then we try to do the same thing again. Okay, yeah, it doesn't crash anymore. Great, it's fixed. So rinse, repeat every day of that. Um, so I, I t had a tendency to wander around a bit, you know, a little bit more than I should have just to, you know, because I was, I was actually genuinely intrigued by what it took to make video games. Like it was like being behind the scenes of a movie set for me. I wanted to find out how does this, how does games get made? Because I love games so much, you know, this is fun, you know, see how artists are creating stuff and how designers are coming up with ways to play it. And the, you know, programmers are, how are they solving issues and all of these kinds of things? Well, then that led me to audio. And I met the audio director, and um, and so because I was already a, a player, you know, drummer, uh, he was also a, a bassist, and so you know they had like kind of a side band they were doing, and they invited me to come jam with them, and so I did that for a bit, and that was kind of fun. And um, so, needless to say, my uh, my career as a tester didn't didn't uh, pan out quite well. But uh, you know, after I graduated high school, I had I had hit him up again you know, the audio director. And I said, Hey, you know, if you need an intern or help after I get out of school, you know, I'd love to, you know, do whatever I can to help out, you know, in, in the audio and just let me know. And so he's like, all right, you know, and, um, at that point I was composing my own music. So I had a four track at home. I had a you know guitar and a keyboard and I was just messing around and writing my own stuff. And so he listened to my demo and he liked what he heard enough to give me a shot to see if I could, you know, uh, dive into what they were doing. So he gave me some tests and some some different uh, programs to see if how quickly I could learn them and ha navigate my way around. And eventually, uh, I started uh, just being the full time composer. You know, after after a few months of of proving myself. So uh, that's a very unique situation. I don't know that that would necessarily happen today because back then we're talking about the old Nintendo Entertainment System as the bar to hit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so you talk about stripping things down again to its base bare elements like you know we're talking about the drinks earlier right it's the same thing i've got a melody a bass line a harmony and a, and a rhythm and that's all i've got you know monophonically to work with that'd be like saying hey darren write me a piece with a flute a clarinet a bass and a snare drum go you know and i had to do that for the nes and uh but you know things progressively over time uh you know had uh, evolved you know technology was rapidly increasing so we went from that to sega genesis to super nintendo the pc you know and the audio cards you know had better and bigger capabilities so by the time we get into the mid 90s now we can do streaming audio now we can actually record it and put it in the game the way it's supposed to sound the way we recorded it and it's gone up and up since then now we're using full orchestras you know for the last couple of decades so um it's uh 
it's been a, a real journey. Uh, and in fact, that was my college, if you want to think of it that way. You know, what you would have to go to college for now to get enough skill set in order to pull off what's necessary, I actually had the unique opportunity to grow with that industry as it evolved. That's, yeah, and timing does matter, right? It's timing and luck do exist. And, yeah. you, and, you, and you hear Steve Martin talk about that too, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. so there is a certain thing but you have to be prepared as well and 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 be eager and put in the action and and yeah. put yourself out there um you mentioned orchestra so yeah that's the budapest orchestra that recorded that second tune that we were listening to the war is evolving yeah um so that was for a game called uh, gray goo that uh, i'd done with petroglyph it's a company that i've been with for the last 14 years and um it was a real-time strategy game, sci-fi, but, you know, had a really good budget to work with. And, and so we were able to make something of, of high quality and, and a deep story uh, rich um, game as well. So we had like full motion CG animated cutscenes and that, you know, progress the story along in between your missions. And uh, so we had the budget for an orchestra, which is nice when that happens. And so then... Um, I uh, flew over to Budapest, um, worked with an arranger there uh, from, from Germany, actually, who met me there. And, and then we um, both were in, sitting in on the session. Um, I, I could have uh, conducted if I wanted, but I preferred to sit in the booth and really listen for what's happening so that I can, you know, we can correct any spaces in the music that uh, you know, any, any sections of bars or whatever that, that are required. Anyhow, um, that was a fun experience. I had a great sounding room, great players, really I love the fact that uh, the Budapest Orchestra does not fear triple forte. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll get in there and just dig in, and, and the brass especially is just like, Bang! I'm like, yes! <laughs> so it's not, so no cool. feeling like that. When you recorded it, I mean, uh, wrote for it, did you um, mock it up and use all synth stuff at home just so you knew what it was, was, was going to happen? Yeah, I did. I, I do that for all my scores. Um, I do mock-ups for everything. Uh, cause it's never, uh, apparent right up front, whether or not the budget for an orchestra will be there. So it's only once in a while that, that, that happens. And so I have to, you know, really just proceed with the idea that, okay, I need to make this sound as good as I can on my own first. And then if that budget gets approved, great, then I can, you know, get it arranged and, and, and taken care of. But uh, if not, then at least I know what I have will still work. Nice. And that they... And they have done that in the past where you've just used your mock-up? Yeah. In fact, uh, the uh, Star Wars uh, tune, uh, Re uh, Rebellion Advantage, that was done as a mock-up. So that was, uh, that was me doing a simulated orchestra on that and just trying to match it to sound tonally like what the film recordings did. Yes. And that is a challenge. And what's the number one thing you find to be the difference between live versus MIDI? Wow. Uh, it's really about um, the expression, the dynamics, how that really sounds when it's played by human beings. Uh, there is nothing that can simulate that. There just isn't. Uh, you can get close, but you know, there's something to be said for the human element that really makes it just have that organic feel. I mean, music is emotion. It is feeling. And so because of that, you really want the end result as much as possible to to connect with whoever's playing it that way or whoever's listening to it that way yeah and i'm i'm about to do a um master class on zoom for asmac which is the society for music arrangers and composers and mm -hmm. and that's one of the main things we talk about especially arranging for horn section um a lot of people will just use midi horns versus real horns and the sound difference is just uh, astonishing i mean <laughs> you can't yeah. really um you can't really simulate it and it's because of the waveform that actually is coming out of a saxophone or a trombone um those two in particular trumpet you can kind of hide in there a little bit because it's an octave higher i don't know what exactly it is about the physics of it but trombone and sax you can just hear right away and go there's a stuffiness a dead kind of stiffness to it and um um, so it's really neat to hear hear MIDI horns and then you hear live horns and go, yeah. And then you've mentioned it too, Frank. You're like, a funk band isn't a funk band if it doesn't have horns, you know? Yeah. So there's a power to that air moving through the horns and going out into the air, you know? 
Yeah, and uh, you know, I really was um, obsessed with horn sections from an early age too, uh, just from that very connection. And anytime I had the chance to play live where there was horns, I just enjoyed it that much more uh, because it was like it's it's like having two bands on stage. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, it's like you got this powerhouse horn section, and then you got the rhythm section, like you know killing it and and both things together just you know that right combination and if the sounds good on stage it's just everybody feels that and and that translates to an audience versus just a few guys getting up there in t-shirts and jeans and just you know trudging away you know like there's there's more energy there and and it's infectious you have so many skills as a musician and um you know kudos to you thanks uh well, I mean, a lot of that, you know, has evolved over time. And I think that, you know, the modern day musician for today, uh, even if you're getting started, you need to start thinking ahead already about how playing an instrument is not enough anymore, about how having an understanding of recording is important, because especially right now, I mean, we're in the middle of this COVID thing, everybody's staying home, there's no live entertainment for the foreseeable future until things clear up. And so we have to rely on other means of you know being able to work and or express ourselves and the one way we can do that is to record ourselves and collaborate with people and and if you have to really you know get get your mind thinking about how okay how can i at least get a foundational setup that will work professionally for people so i can record tracks remotely so i can play to a click so i can video myself so i can be part of other video compilation projects and and you know have these these other forms of what we do in place to move forward with that's so right i mean whoever's listening out there you need to take this to heart because um <clears throat> if if you are just playing out live gigs. You know, we know that's been waning now. So it's a really important to be able to record your sound quality, but then also video yourself. And those can be two separate endeavors. And so it doesn't matter what the digital audio workstation is. I'm an Ableton guy. I'm an Ableton certified trainer. I, this speaks to me for live performance and recording and creating ideas. But Frank, he uses Cubase and it doesn't matter. It's like whatever car you enjoy driving, uh, yeah. It'll get you to that place, but you have to have a car. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, and um, speaking of like modern technology and all, uh, I want to play a little piece of a bit of Frank's latest release, um, which is super cool with this, all these sounds and really aggressive groove. And it really speaks to me as an electronic music lover. So listen to a little of this. So Frank, when you're doing, when you're composing a piece like this, what what element are you doing first? A lot of this comes just from different uh, instrument patches that I've dialed up, and I'll do a riff on one, and a riff on another, and a riff on another, and then I'll start kind of playing a ranger at that point. And then um, once I get like a, a, a rhythm in place, or like the, the you know punch or the vibe I want, then maybe I'll feel like picking up the guitar and adding some you know rock elements to that. So those but were this, real guitars, right? Yeah, I played the guitar on that. Um, everything else is synthesized, uh, but... Um, like, that's this real. One, this is one of my favorite parts. Yeah. 
stuff like that. That's like a, more sound design elements, you know, that I kind of picked up from uh, a lot of um, EDM dubstep kind of, you know, programmed sounding tracks that I've heard that I, that I liked. But uh, with a lot of electronic music, and you can probably relate to this, you know, for with your musical background too, of course, is that as composers and people that play live and, and have an understanding of how, you know, real instruments should work, if you apply that to electronic music, it creates its own vibe that is different from the average programmer electronic artist. You know what I mean? Like anybody can get behind a laptop and, and some software and some plugins and make some electronic music, you know, with that's on a basic level or a very uh, creative programmed level where yeah. there's, it's more about the sound uh, and the way that it moves and, and, and changes. But in this case, I'm applying real musicianship to an electronic piece and applying the sound design and programming. Yeah, I mean, but just like this, where that groove totally changes, to me, that's always a more musical element. Yeah. You know, and instead of just going with the same thing for six minutes. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's coming from your drummer background and loving different grooves and really kind of wanting to do something a little unique. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but just, you know, wanting to do something different uh, with the genres and or tools that are available that people might be familiar with that are cool in their own right, but haven't been applied in maybe this way yet. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the angle that I go with combining hybridizing uh, electronic with, with rock music and with real instrumentation, but also clever sound design and and just arrangement sake of from a composer's state of mind rather than a you know just standard uh electronic uh programming state of mind that's so right that's exactly where i'm coming from with my my electric trombone dj and my electro horns trying to use a live horn section incorporated with ableton with all these modern sounds but this traditional kind of horn section thing arrange that out be real funky like tower of power earth wind and fire chicago um that kind of real forward heavy leading horn sound but on on top of all of this just awesome drum grooves and stuff and i mean this music's a blast right i mean yeah yeah i mean there's so much out there and just about everything's been done to a degree now. So it's, it's really about finding your, your voice, going back to that, and, and finding a, a clever way to incorporate that into, you know, what speaks to you. And, and if that means crossing some boundaries and shifting some genres together and, and, or, or just being a, a clever arranger even, I mean, all of that can be what your thing is, and then you can take that and run with it. And that and that's what people will recognize, you know, like that's for me, a lot of people associate me with the Command and Conquer video game franchise because I've composed the majority of those games. And that's what a lot of people, you know, enjoyed musically from what I've done since my early years. And a lot of that was very much in that vein. It was the combination of of all of these different genres of music that were allowed to exist in a video game. And that kind of hadn't been done at that point to the degree that I that I pushed it. So and I was just allowed to be creative. That's another thing I need to attribute this to. Um, you know, the producers and designers of the game, you know, and my audio director encouraged me to be creative and try a lot of things to see what could stick and what maybe wouldn't. But in the end of the day, they were like, you know what? This variety is actually kind of cool. Why don't we just go with that? The leadership matters. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. You know, so if, if you're allowed to kind of, you know, try a lot of different things for the sake of seeing what will work, you might be surprised that a lot of it could work, you know, and that's, that's really, really the point. That's great advice. Um, everybody, uh, if you're interested in what you've been hearing from Frank, both of him speaking and from his music, make sure you go to his website, frankklapacki.com. Uh, super impressive website, man, uh, which is no surprise once you've heard the quality of uh, all the things he's talking about, all the stuff Frank's done and his music. It's like uh, you need this whole package. So if you want to see how to do a website right, go check that out. He's in all these bands, all these different projects, and it's organized really clearly. Uh, you can buy stuff right off of his website. Um, lots of videos, lots of MP3s, and uh, it's really cool. And